Hi. Um, I want to talk about the issue of historical authenticity in films, because this is something that often crops up, particularly with period films, um, as part of critique. So um, what prompted me to make this one, actually, I posted um, a photograph I'd taken of seven films I have based around classical antiquity. Um, those are just subjects based around that era. So, for example, seven films were Immortals, Cleopatra, the Elizabeth Taylor version of Cleopatra, um, Alexander by Oliver Stone, Gladiator, which needs no introduction, Pompeii, which I've just done a review of, The Passion of the Christ, which was in the first century. Um, what was the other two now? Uh, the Eagle, which is set along Hadrian's Wall. And I think there was one more um, which temporarily eludes me. But anyway, um, these were these were all films set around classical antiquity. And I got one response from the Quinn saying, uh, as long as you realise these are all Americanized garbage. Okay. <laughs> um, well, firstly, it's a bit of a clump together for those films because there's a lot of difference, for example, between The Passion of the Christ and Cleopatra in terms of style, in terms of um, how it's done. But it got me thinking about the wider issue of historical authenticity. And there is a simple thing that I think people need to remember. This. Filmmakers set out to make something that is entertaining or moving or captivating. Not make a documentary. And I would say you would find it, have a real struggle to find any history-based film that is 100% accurate. I don't think there is any. I've never seen any. And that includes some of my favourite films, such as Titanic. Titanic has mistakes. Still a masterpiece, in my opinion. Um, so I think that people need to realise that. So when people sort of judge films, you know, and they judge them as, oh, this never happened, that never happened, etc. They need to make an allowance for what I've just mentioned. Filmmakers have two or three hours to condense a particular subject, depending on the running length. Nowadays, the average running length is about, let's say, two hours. Um, even in the, you know, sweeping matinees, which ran into three hours and so on, even they had to condense subjects. Um, so I think people need to bear that in mind. Now, I, I, so for that reason, I do allow artistic license. With Pompeii, for example, um, the exact nature of the eruption took place over a longer period of time, and there were some differences in terms of hieroclastic flow. So, for example, when the characters Milo and Cassia are are fleeing the city on horseback from the pyroclastic flow, sure, it probably wouldn't have happened that way. But you know what? It looks good cinematically. It looks good cinematically, and that surely is the point of what a filmmaker is supposed to do. Um, there are times when the inaccuracies are so strong that I would absolutely join the courts of criticism. So an example of that is 10,000 BC, which was not really a great film. I wasn't overly impressed by it. it had some good acting sequences, but it, anachronisms in that were so obvious that, you know, you couldn't make allowances. For example, they had Neolithic hunter-gatherers meeting ancient Egyptian civilization when there's a gap of about 5,000 years. The film's called 10,000 BC, going back 12,000 years. Uh, the earliest pyramids are dated to about 5,000 years, roughly, Egyptian pyramids. Um, so that's just, you know, the, the inaccuracy there is such that it cannot be overlooked. Um, Braveheart is another example. Braveheart done very well. Um, I believe it got the Academy Award for Best Picture in '95. Um, it got a lot of awards, a lot of nods for its soundtrack and so on. It is cinematically an impressive film in many ways, but with Braveheart, you had the Scottish um, warriors in Iron Age body paint, as would have been worn by ancient Britons 
or speculated to have been worn by ancient Britons. Now, this film is set in the um, late 13th century. So you're talking a gap of about a millennium. Um, they also wear tartan that was only uh, only came into the sort of four in Scottish military uniforms in the 15th century. The earliest tartans believed about be about mid 1400s, certainly of that style. So loads of two obvious anachronisms. The Battle of Stirling Bridge doesn't even feature the bridge. Um, it was a significant part of the battle because a lot of the English troops actually drowned in the river. Um, that's just totally admitted. Uh, they depict the Princess Isabella of France, known as the She Wolf of France, as a grown woman played by the beautiful Sophie Marceau. In reality, she was three years old at the time, and therefore, unless he was a predator, highly unlikely to have had any sort of relationship with William Wallace. They also depict Wallace as being a learned man who could speak Latin and so on, when the reality was he was son of a minor noble. Um, so the inaccuracies in Braveheart, Braveheart are thick and fast. Um, having said that, the battle scenes are intense and the brutality of the period is realistic. I mean, the intensity of the battle and the brutal war, uh, the brutal weapons that were used, that's realistic. Um, and the soundtrack is beautiful. It, um, it has been used somewhat as a propaganda tool for Scottish nationalists, which, given my politics, obviously, um, yeah, <laughs> that's a bit galling. But um, nevertheless, in and of itself, it's uh, it's a moving film. Um, oh, another piece of inaccuracy, come to think about it, in the scene where Wallace is hung, drawn and quartered. Physically, if he's had his organs removed, I don't know, I'm not an anatomist, but I would imagine it's physically impossible to cry out freedom if you've just had your liver and heart removed. It's just physically impossible. So, again, artistic license. This also applies to casting, and this is a controversial issue because it taps into the whole identity politics thing. Um, I mentioned Mary Queen of Scots, where you had... Um, Minority actors cast in historic as historic characters who were absolutely white, and we know that from historic portraits. You know, there's no ambiguity there. It's not like, oh, well, they could have been. We know they were white people. Um, yeah, needless to say, if the tables were reversed and you had a white actor playing um, a historically ethnic role, that would be, you know, held okay to be protests and Oscars so white, etc. Um, so that I do find a bit irritating. Um, I think with historic films, um, I think you can make some allowances. For example, if you're depicting 1830s London just as a broad sort of example, and you have some minority actors in the background um, in a bustling port scene, I have no issue with that. But, you know, you cannot have, for example, a black actor playing Lord Melbourne, just as an example. Um you could never have a black actress playing Queen Victoria, and if you did, that would just be so blatantly an attempt at virtue signalling at the price of historical authenticity. It would just be absurd. Now, with Mary Queen of Scots, they weren't minor extras. They were quite important characters. For example, um, Bess of Hardwick was a leading courtesan of Queen Elizabeth I, a leading lady-in-waiting, as I understand it. She was a middle-aged white woman, um, certainly at the time the film is set. Emma Chan is clearly not. She is a young British Chinese actress, so that's you know it's nothing personal against Gemma Chan as an actress, an actor. You're going to take whatever role she can get, but it's just not accurate. And you know you're you're getting this increasingly in the film industry, and I think a big part of it is to try and dissuade criticism about the supposed lack of diversity. Um, in fact, the director of that film boasted that she would never have an all-white cast. Well, I can understand the contention if you have an all-white cast for contemporary films, but historic films, where historically the demographics would have been majority white. I mean, it's not that this country has ever had a point where it's 100% white. In the Elizabethan period, there would have been Moorish traders, for example, in London. But... It's when it's so obviously done for politically correct reasons, it just becomes a bit, you know, people read through that. And I think 
I mean, that film didn't do particularly well at box office, and I think that was one reason. So I do think that historical authenticity matters in so far as casting. I think you need to get people that roughly look like they're the historic character they're playing. And this also applies to white actors. You can't get a white actor who looks totally different from the person they're playing. So you can't get, for example, Stephen Fry playing, I don't know, um, Julius Caesar. Or maybe a better example would be you cannot get um, someone like Stephen Fry playing Abraham Lincoln. Because, you know, there's no visible uh, similarities. Of course, nowadays, makeup people could do wonders. I mean, it's incredible what they've done to Christian Bale to look like Dick Cheney. So I suppose that's a caveat there. But anyway, what do you think of historical authenticity in films? My take would be kind of a semi-neutral approach. I would say we need to allow filmmakers to be filmmakers. They're not documentarians. What I what does irritate me a little is when there are statements, maybe it's part of the screenplay, maybe it's some of the monologue in the film, and blatantly false things are stated in the monologue that is... I would take issue with that. Um, but I don't think we should be overly harsh on filmmakers in terms of getting details 100% correct. I would say so long as it's broadly in keeping with the theme of things and broadly in keeping with authenticity, then some allowances can be made. So, for example, another thing in Pompeii, they showed the women being more involved in politics than Roman women would have been. So yeah, that's some artistic license, but they're important characters. So you can't really have them as background characters as they are important characters to the story. Therefore, some alliances are required. Um, so I'm okay with that. I, I think it's, if the end result is a good cinematic picture, so long as the anachronisms aren't too obvious, so long as the inaccuracy isn't too blunt, then I can forgive that. Um, so I'd go around the middle line of things. A film like 10,000 BC where the inaccuracies are just laughable, you know, that does, for me, take away from the quality of the film. But where the inaccuracies are relatively minor and where, you know, with Pompeii, uh, there was praise for the period costumes, there was praise for the set designs, and that was, you know, um, the director, Paul W.S. Anderson, did actually do his homework on that. That wasn't just, oh, well, just go with the flow and see what looks good. He actually went to Pompeii, you know, the guy done his research. So I think that people need to bear this in mind that filmmakers do research. Sometimes they get it right, sometimes they get it wrong. But in the end of the day, Hollywood in particular, it's about entertainment. And if you're going to be really prudish and, you know, nitpick at every single thing, then, then just watch documentaries because... I don't think any filmmaker claims that their work is 100% authentic as a historic piece. First and foremost, they are in the entertainment industry, and I think that needs to be understood. Now, if I was a director, if I was a filmmaker, accuracy would be pretty important for me, but I would also, you know, what I've learned by looking at films, what I've learned by looking at extras is filmmakers don't have the luxury of being 100% accurate. Let's say historic accuracy it means that a particular depiction of an event is a little bit less um, dramatic as the film would portray it, um, then that isn't going to lend itself to the screen, is it? So I think you need to make some allowances for filmmakers. As long as they're not telling outright lies on a very big scale, um, and then it's fair enough for historians to criticise that. Um, I also, a big issue I would take, um, and I'll close with this, is where a historic person has been vilified by film. Now, I love Titanic. I, I didn't like the way that Titanic used a historic person, um, second officer Murdoch, and they, excuse me, first officer Murdoch, um, Wilde was chief officer, uh, and they... They depicted that he killed himself. That was a controversial scene and it actually took 20th Century Fox going to his hometown and apologising. Um, they shouldn't have done that. That was based on apparently passengers had seen an officer kill themselves. What they should have done is had a kind of composite character rather than actually name someone who has living descendants um, when there's no evidence that ever happened. Murdoch was a strict Presbyterian and it's unlikely he would have killed himself. 
doesn't mean it never happened. It's just unlikely. Also, I've said before how I feel that uh, White Star Line chairman versus me has been vilified by history and he's been vilified in every film. You know, every Titanic film we've seen has made Ismi look bad and I think that's unfair. So I would also take issue with that where historic figures are, I can understand them being ambiguous where there is conflicting accounts of their personality, but I don't like when figures are outright vilified when there is scope for doubt. Um, I mean, in the case of Ismi, he was smeared by the yellow press by, um, I believe it was the Lord Beaverbrook or Lord Rothermere can't remember which, but one of them, um, they used the yellow press to smear Britismi because they were business rivals. So people need to be aware of this too, that um, with historic films, sometimes they can either lionize a figure to the point where it takes away their flaws, or they can vilify a figure to the point where it excludes some of their, um, their better qualities. So let me know your thoughts on historical authenticity in films. But you know, people who say, oh, it's all rubbish, it's all fake, that's why I prefer. Well, okay, watch documentaries. The bottom line is films are not meant to be documentaries. Now, if a filmmaker says my film's 100% accurate and it's not, then I say, you know, free reign, give them all the criticism they deserve.